And today we talk about propolis. Welcome everybody. Uh, let me know if everything is working. Uh, I'm very happy with this live stream. Let me open the comments here. I want to know if everything is fine. Please, if you can see and hear me and listen to me very well, please start to use the chat so you I know everything is fine. So it is with great pleasure today that I'm going to start to talk a subject that is one of my favorite propolis. And to start, nobody better than my guest today, Dr. Mike Simpron from the USDA uh, ARS in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, we're going to talk about propolis. Let me bring Mike Simone. Where are you, Mike? Here we go. Hey, Mike. Good to hey, have you. Yeah, it's great to be here, and I'm excited to talk about my favorite subject, too. Good, good, good. So let me let me give you a little introduction about my my understanding of propolis. And actually, as a honeybee researcher now for 16 years, uh, I I was comment with you before in the background, but I want to I want to share the story with everybody here. There is two things in 16 years of research that I'm really confident about saying that really works. One was RNAi that uh, against viruses that really work in my hands. I could uh, generate data uh, demonstrating the potential of that for many years, many times in my hand. So I'm very confident with that. The second one is propolis. Propolis are able to generate data showing that help the honeybees and could help beekeepers up with, with that knowledge. And I would like to know your perspective with that, how you end up working with propolis, how long, you, uh, what you can talk about, uh, about how you, how we start with that. Yeah. So, uh, I kind of a little bit of luck as in all things, right? So, and a little bit of good timing. So I've been working on propolis related projects since about 2005. Um, so quite a while now. And uh, and really I was in Marla Spivak's lab at the University of Minnesota at that point. And uh, we had some Brazilian collaborators and uh, they had kind of wanted us to to look at some propolis stuff, and at that same time, went to a meeting, uh, the International Union for the Study of Social Insects meeting uh, in Washington D.C., and um, and saw a talk on ants, and ants were bringing resin into their nest and sort of dropping it around in little globs all around, and we were like, hey, you know, that's propolis, right? And it was kind of like, I wonder what's happening, and what role does this play in, in bee health? Because there's been so there had been so much at that point on propolis and human health, but really hardly anything on bees and bee health. So it was a really kind of eye-opening thing. Like, hey, why why haven't hasn't this been studied really well? And and let's do it. That's very nice. Uh, so you are how 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 many years are doing that now? Working with propolis. For at least 15 years, probably 16, yeah. Yeah, you've been busy. A, a lot of the publications, the good, the, the, the big publications about propolis really with the very, very de demonstrable data about the benefit of propolis to honeybees is coming from you and your and the, the group that you were working uh, before. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Baton Rouge lab for the people at home that doesn't know about the lab and the mission of the dead lab? Yeah, so I'm uh, a research scientist at the, the Baton Rouge Bee Lab where the Honeybee Breeding Genetics and Physiology Research Lab, so we cover everything. Um, so one of our main focus has been breeding mite resistant bees uh, and really um, working on that with both the Russian line and then the Varroa sensitive hygiene or now called Paul line. Uh, those are two of the sort of flagship breeding programs at the lab. We're doing all kinds of things, um, looking at from um, resist, amitraz resistance in Varroa, led by Frank Grinkovich, to uh, development of algal um, sort of nutrient supplements, and that's work led by Vincent Rusigliano, who's one of our new scientists. So really, we really cover everything uh, from genes to colonies, and from toxicology, physiology. 
um, you know, cellular mechanisms. We, we run the gamut to everything. I, I also do a lot of work with honeybee viruses, um, both at individual and colony levels. And uh, we work a lot with commercial beekeepers. Um, so our mission is uh, really, I think, the broadest of the bee labs, but also the most integrative because we have to know uh, a lot about everything and all these aspects to bring it together from um, to really uh, work on breeding uh, healthy honeybees. Very nice, very nice. I work at USDA myself a long time ago, and I, I know the, the lab and the personnel, not in Louisiana, I was in Beltsville at the, at the time, but I, I know the system, I know how it works. It's pretty good people working at that. Mike, I can I ask you to give the, a little presentation, a little overview about propolis for us? and with the little data that you, you have. And from there, I have a bunch of questions to you. Are you ready for that? <laughs> I'm ready and hopefully I'll convert everybody else to think as you do that propolis, you know, okay. it's the one that's a, proof thing. That's my mission now. Let me just stop this and I need to put you or I'm gonna stop sharing my thing and I'm gonna, you need to start sharing yours right now. Okay. And for the people at home, I don't, I'm not getting the chat working right now. So let's start this slideshow with, with Mike and I'm gonna try to fix this while he is giving his presentation. All right, are you, are you ready to go? All right, thanks. Um, and thanks again. And uh, it really is a pleasure to talk with you uh, today about propolis and, and really kind of these whole multifaceted effects that uh, that propolis and resin yeast by honeybees has uh, really for the beekeeping uh, industry as a whole, I think. So we're gonna try and advance the slides if it will let me. There we go. Um, and really, again, kind of coming from uh, the honeybee breeding lab uh, and really kind of my long-term goal is uh, really breeding a better bee. And, and, and a lot of that comes from understanding how bees defend themselves uh, using their own natural traits uh, as really part of this sort of integrated pest management strategy. So um, by using these defenses like propolis uh, into our, our honeybee populations, uh, that can really uh, create healthier bees as part of this really multi-layered strategy. And I hopefully will convince you that propolis fits into this really well. Um, I'm gonna kind of get into all of these little aspects, but really um, what I'm talking about in this overview is that propolis are these plant, um, are these resins that bees collect, bring back to the hive and distribute. And it has kind of these impacts on individual uh, bee health, but it also then translates to the colony level. And to just step back a little bit, uh, there's a lot that we know about uh, resin and social insects in general. Um, many bee and ant species will collect and use resins for nest construction and protection against predators. So sort of resin use uh, isn't uh, unique to honeybees, but the mixture that bees bring in, the, they bring in resins and mix it with varying amounts of wax. Uh, and when honeybees bring it into the hive, we then call that propolis. So I tend to actually mistakenly, or you know, for better or for worse, use resin and propolis interchangeably. But propolis is really that mixture of of wax uh, and various resins that bees bring in, honeybees specifically. And where are they getting these resins from? So basically, these are antimicrobial compounds that uh, various. Um, mostly herbaceous and woody shrub or woody shrubs and trees produce um, to protect their leaf buds and wounds uh, and really they're protecting them against uh, bacteria and fungal infections and also um, other insects that might be eating these leaves so these are plant produced defensive compounds they're very chemically diverse uh, and really common uh, sources in temperate regions are poplars pine birch and gum Now, in terms of its antimicrobial activity, this is some work that was led by Mike Wilson um, and with Marla Spivak at the University of Minnesota. Uh, all this shows is that um, propolis concentration and then the 
um, growth relative to controls of, um, of the chalk brood fungus in a lab setting. And you can see basically there's sort of two sets of, of lines. One has much higher inhibition than the other. And these are ones collected from California to Georgia. And so there is regional variation in the effectiveness of propolis in the lab. And this translates um, to also, or really is explained by variation among plant sources. So this here is American foulbrood, which is a bacteria. Again, lab cultures. This is another study done by Mike Wilson and the Spivak lab. And these are different populous species. And you can see um, the black line on the bottom. That one uh, was really highly antimicrobial, uh, whereas the green one at the top you know, didn't work very well. And then you have other ones um, like deltoides, which is known to be a, a, a really common um, plant that uh, honeybees get resin from. You can see that that actually does pretty well once you get to high concentrations and not so well low concentrations. So there's some interesting variation among plant sources that likely explains the regional variation. But other than, you know, these sort of lab-based studies, there have been lab studies against of propolis against Varroa, um, several things against chalk brood and American fowl brood. Um, really, there'd be limited information on how or if um, propolis function to reduce disease in an actual honeybee colony um, prior to starting my work. And really this idea is that resin forms a social immunity. So we have physiological immunity, our, uh, our immune system, that would be an individual immunity. But honeybees, because they live in colonies, they also have social immunity. So that's when individuals within the hive are doing something that then prevents disease at the colony level. And the idea comes from this, that foraging for resins is really energetically demanding for an individual bee. It takes them a half an hour to an hour um, to collect these really sticky resins. You know, they not only, you know, stick that resin to our hands, but they can glue themselves to the hive entrance um, if it's a really hot day. And it provides no direct individual reward that we know of, like uh, foraging for nectar can. Um, and so really the idea is that bees are collecting these plant defensive compounds and using them as their own colony level immune defense. And how does this function? So we have to think about where bees are putting resin in the nest and we have to think of like, okay, not in managed colonies, but in tree cavities sort of where they evolved, right? And Tom Seeley coined this term, the propolis envelope. So here's a tree cavity, it's a cross section in that orange line around that's totally lighting the nest is um, is propolis and they line that entire nest cavity with this thin layer of propolis so it envelops the nest and this is that same tree um, cut out and you can see everywhere where there's comb it's really varnished so they varnish it with propolis um, and above that you can even see some sort of fungal growth above that line where it's varnished and where the nest isn't uh, and really propolis is creating this um, really homeostatic nest environment. It's controlling humidity, controlling moisture, but it also, it's creating a smooth place for comb attachment. Um, so it's doing a lot of things. Um, and we also hypothesized that it had a disease, uh, anti-disease effects. And really the first study we did was to kind of look at this propolis envelope um, and the effect that this had on the bee's immune system. Uh, and now this is talking about physiological immunity and how that translates into social or colony level, colony level immunity. And so basically we painted these small colonies, nucleus colonies, five uh, frame nuke boxes, and we made them resin rich or resin poor by painting on extracts of propolis. Um, the middle is propolis from Brazil that we know what that plant source is and the bottom reddish one was um, Minnesota propolis. And now we measured the immune system levels in bees of a known age and also determined the overall levels of bacteria in these colonies. And what we found was pretty exciting and it was really that bees in these propolis enriched colonies invested less energy in their immune response. And this is likely, level, likely due to decreased levels of microbes who so kind of this idea that, oh, it's a clean house so your immune system isn't ramped up all the time. And really, um, this kind of translates into this idea of social immunity because colonies 
um, of bees with less activated immune systems have shown to be more productive and produce more honey. So by having kind of this more stable, reduced immune response could actually increase the productivity of colonies. And the baseline is sort of that the hive environment alone can affect bee health. But really, what does this mean? And does it, so is probolis in this way, uh, this pretty subtle effect, right? But it, it was our first finding um, and an exciting one at that. But so we needed to translate that into, does it have a direct role against disease? And so we did this experiment where we challenged colonies, again, these resin-rich and resin-poor colonies with uh, chalk brood, which is a fungal pathogen. So we gave them these spores that causes these chalk brood mummies, and they were either in these resin-rich or resin-poor uh, boxes. And basically this propolis envelope uh, greatly reduced the in intensity of chalk brood infection. So the resin-rich uh, challenge colonies had very, very few um, chalk brood mummies produced as a result of this infection. And so we wanted to follow this up to say, okay, well, how are propolis foragers, how are resin foragers responding to infection? And so we looked at the number of resin foragers coming in before and after uh, we gave them this challenge. And so if there was no change in amount of resin foragers coming in, you'd expect these bars to be around zero. And if you have a, an increase in resin foraging, you have a a positive, uh, a bar in the positive range. And we did this over three years of study, uh, the ends are colony numbers. And what we found was uh, pretty clear evidence every year that honeybees are self-medicating with resin. So when a colony is challenged with chalk brood, when you give them chalk brood, they bring in more resin. And this is a super cool finding. Uh, I still think it's probably one of the coolest things um, that I've done and found. And we really didn't believe it at first because it was just really so exciting. And it's so particularly exciting because this is probably the most unique case of self-medication across the animal kingdom still, uh, because the honeybees aren't ingesting resin and uh, adult honeybees don't get sick with chalk root. It's a larval disease. So it's the adults of a colony responding to colony level or to larval infection. Um, and so it's really this sort of self-medicating at the colony level, which is particularly exciting or at the group level. Um, we're still working out the mechanism of this response. And interestingly, um, other groups from Europe have found um, similar things uh, in terms of self-medication uh, or potential. Uh, in terms of varroa infection. So uh, this one group from Italy found that um, increased resin foraging uh, with response to varroa infestation. And another group um, led by Sarah Leonhardt um, found um, that it was partly related to viruses or could um, knock down uh, increased viral infection um, with the more resin that they brought in. So there might be an interplay with varroa and viruses here um, too in some cases. But self-medicating um, with resins doesn't happen against all pathogens. Um, and here I'm showing sort of that similar chalkboard data with the American Falbrood in. So we gave them the American Falbrood uh, and they did not increase resin foraging then which is interesting because um, propolis does reduce infection. So this is work that Renata Borba did um, with Marla Spivak um, and found, um, so the, the gray bar, the uh, plain gray bars are the one colonies with no propolis and the um, ones with the diagonal lines are um, colonies that were enriched with propolis. Uh, and you can see that it, AFB was knocked down um, by propolis, so they do not self-medicating with it. And so really, what does this all mean in terms of beekeeping uh, and sort of putting all of these pieces together and are there implications for hive design? Um, so, you know, commercial standard, Langstroth boxes are smooth, obviously tree cavities are not. Um, and so can we do something to make a commercial box more like a tree cavity? And Renata Borba did um, a lot of work uh, on um, modifying equipment to promote propolis production, to promote them um, to create this own propolis envelope. So uh, on the, the left, that's where she stapled 
commercial propolis traps inside, although you have to cut them up. And recently, um, Marla Spivak and I have worked with a, a producer um, that's produced these boxes that are both rough and grooved um, as a way to encourage bees to promote um, propolis um, production and really for them to coat the boxes in this propolis envelope. And so following this through, we did kind of local tests, but what I wanted to show you today is some really new results and new data um, that I haven't shown much before that's um, testing uh, these boxes and increased propolis deposition and a commercial beekeeping operation. Um, and so as part of this experiment, we sent 120 colonies, 60 of these rough uh, groove boxes, and then 60 standard commercial boxes um, through a migratory pollination route. Uh, and this is repeated over two years with this um, 120 colonies each year. And they went through this four full migratory route. They went from Mississippi to different apiaries in South Dakota, um, and then to California for almonds. We sampled them in August at the honey harvest, and then in California um, in almonds in February. Uh, and we also did some pesticide residue analysis uh, from wax and propolis uh, from the first year of study. Just to give you an idea of uh, the sort of what these rough boxes do and how they um, collect more propolis. Um, and I would say there's another study on this, um, uh, Hodges, um, Delaplane and, and Brosi published that a few years ago, um, showing that rough boxes um, simulates propolis. Um, but here we have um, the two different years and then control colonies, you can see between August and February, they really didn't increase propolis uh, very much. Uh, and then um, August and February, so this is just the, the year one, even in by August, they had more propolis in the rough boxes. And then in February, they had even more. And I should say that these scores are basically, we take pictures of them and then we rate them and they're independently rated by five people uh, on a scale of one to 10. And basically we average out these scores to get those results. Um, and now for the data in terms of colony populations while in almonds, because this is obviously what matters in terms of fulfilling pollination um, contracts. So we have the propolis poor and the propolis rich. On average, they had um, over a frame of bees more in these propolis rich colonies. Uh, it was marginally significant. And when we considered total population, including amount of brood and bees, because ultimately that'll result in bigger colonies um, coming out of almonds, um, the colonies that were propolis rich, so these rough grooved boxes, um, had larger populations um, than the propolis poor colonies, which is a pretty cool um, result. And the amount of honey harvested, um, this is from one year, um, from the propolis poor and propolis uh, rich colonies was the same. So this is always one concern of beekeepers that, well, if we encourage propolis, that means we're gonna get a hit uh, on propolis production or on honey production. And we didn't see that um, in the second year of study. In the first year, um, bees overall produced very little honey in those yards. And we did see some um, differences between the, the conventional and the, and the rough boxes depending on the apiary. So it does seem like there could be a conflict, especially when resources are low. Um, but when, when there's a good amount of honey, then um, you get more propolis and uh, the same amount of honey, but you get more bees uh, in almonds. And from the year one data, um, where we had um, the weight of honey and sort of these, um, the scores again, so this is how much propolis, propolis is in a box. We do see that honey production increases with uh, colonies that have more propolis um, when they're in these rough grooved boxes. So there might be some interesting dynamic there of um, more propolis means more honey, um, but that could also relate to colony size and that kind of thing too. So that requires a little bit more follow-up. Now, translating back into that original finding about the immune system. So we look at the immune system of bees from these colonies uh, in these propolis-rich environments. And this is a basin, which is one of these antimicrobial peptides that's part of the individual immune system. 
And on the, um, along the x-axis, we have propolis score from low, meaning very little propolis, to high, lots of propolis. And what you can see is you get more propolis in these colonies. You have a really um, reduced uh, variability among colonies uh, and this overall reduced uh, immune gene expression. So it's really correlating the earlier findings. But really also, it's showing that the immune system is much more stable when you have more propolis. And having a stable immune response is it's sort of like you know what you're going to get and so that you can respond to things more effectively. Um, so we really think this variability is one of these key things that propolis is bringing to the story. And we also found this stabilizing effect on the microbiome. Um, and so this is, um, we have saw this for many different species, but this is um, Bartonella, one of these species that's uh, in the bee gut. And again, we see basically a very stable, similar response in the propolis rich, so the triangles, the one on the right, uh, versus the control that are widely variable. And again, this was, this occurred from many different species. So uh, again, kind of having this stable microbiome uh, is going to be more effective. And we're doing a lot more work on the microbiome to try to see if maybe the propolis effect on the microbiome might stabilize the immune system and that kind of thing. Um, so we're trying to chase it down some of these mechanisms. And this effect from this field study really uh, correlated um, to this work um, that was led by my postdoc, Pro Salao, uh, jointly with Renata Borba, samples that she generated um, when she was in Marla's lab. And um, what we found was that, in general, overall, the honeybee microbiome is stabilized in the presence of propolis. Uh, and then another student with Marla found the same thing in the microbiome of the mouth part. So again, we're seeing these really consistent findings across uh, studies, across body parts, so it's really exciting. Um, so this here is just to give you an idea of that variation in landscape. I'm shifting gears a little bit now from bee health to talk about pesticides a little bit because I think it'll be of interest. Um, and so these, this is where the colonies were in year one. Um, there are a lot of pasture land, but there were some uh, lands, apiaries that were more variable than others, particularly with respect to crops. And we analyzed um, pesticide. We did pesticide residue analysis from wax and, um, and propolis from the same colonies. And this idea is that, you know, what's in the wax we might see in the propolis and that kind of thing, or we can compare them. And what we found was that, um, and this is work that's led um, by Frank Grinkovich here. What we found is that the average number of detections, so the number of compounds um, was um, different in propolis versus wax, mainly with respect to, to herbicides, um, but, but the miticides were higher in wax. But overall, the average quantity detected was so much higher in the propolis than the wax for all of these different classes of compounds. And um, we think this is attributed to the fact that wax is pretty much one material lipophilic, well, propolis contains, um, you know, um, all of these, um, it's a, basically an amalgam that really allows more things to absorb in it because it includes wax, but it includes uh, other things as well. And so um, we really think that that's what's driving that. Uh, there were a few major compounds that contributed to these differences. Um, so amitraz was much higher in propolis um, than, than wax. Um, thymol was present, but it was very similar to wax. Basically lots of herbicides um, and then, uh, and fungicides seem to be um, getting into the propolis more. However, what we don't know really at all is whether or not the um, pesticides and propolis are essentially trapped there or if, uh, and not bioavailable. So they might just be sort of sequestered in the propolis but not really doing anything. And we really think that that's probably more likely the case because their populations wouldn't be growing um, more than control colonies if they were so exposed um, to, to pesticides. But that's something that Frank and I are actively following up on, uh, and it's it's been a really cool avenue of study. 
So overall, we're doing more work on stationary colonies in a later time point and with more propolis deposited to really get a handle of how much propolis is enough, how much is doing the effect, do they really need this propolis envelope or can it just be this patchy? Um, it seems like there are maybe some mixed benefits and costs of increased propolis production uh, and commercial beekeeping, um, but it does seem that the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, and again, we found lots of pesticides and propolis, but impacts appear limited, but this is really preliminary uh, and we're looking forward to see where that research goes. Uh, really, the bottom line here is that propolis can be great for the bees and beekeepers alike. Um, encouraging propolis production, harvesting propolis, um, that can be another line of income for a lot of beekeepers. Um, you can sell propolis, um, you know, and add that as, a, as an additional um, sort of market um, for your industry. Um, but really, from my perspective, we really need to encourage these natural defenses of our bees and um, to really improve our management success. And propolis is just sort of one of these natural defenses that um, can have all of these subtle and big impacts on bee health. And really, uh, you know, this fits into this, the bees are resilient, but we can help make them stronger. Um, and part of this is uh, some work with Marla Spivak uh, led by her really is um, that we're working on is a new breeding program that's going to combine propolis or that is combining propolis collection, hygienic behavior, and low mite reproduction. Um, we're excited about that and seeing where that goes. So with that, um, this work is obviously supported by a lot of different funding agencies and a lot of different people um, and certainly not doing it alone. So I'm happy to take any questions. Mike, Thank you very much for the presentation. You have no idea how happy I am when I see this kind of results because I try in the field, as you know, I, I become a private consultant now working directly with commercial beekeepers now. And I try to convince a lot of them. And I, 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 I got some people that don't, don't believe that. And I, I always ask why, and, and I, I want you to help me to debunk this here live because I think it's important. Uh, a lot of beekeepers think that because bees do not consume propolis, the, the compounds do not reach to them. Can you debunk this, please, with me here live? Because this is not true. Yeah, no, it's not true at all. And, uh, and what we think a lot of what's happening and why we think uh, that propolis envelope matters more is because um, propolis and these resins are so volatile. So they smell so strongly. That's why... You get lots of propolis on your hands. That's really what they don't want. They don't want propolis on their hands. Um, you know, when you wash it off, you're still smelling like propolis. That's, you know, bee smell. You know, when you're working bees and you have that on your hand, um, you can thank propolis for, for that wonderful aroma. Um, and really that, uh, those volatile compounds are sort of emanating through the nest and, and going through the colony and uh, and really that's the, uh, we really think that's sort of the driving thing. There might be some stuff that they're getting from contact um, and we're kind of exploring uh, that difference between the volatiles and the contact and, and how those two things might be playing. But, um, but really the biggest idea is that it's the volatiles, that smell that's sort of emanating through that whole hive is really what's making the difference. And also they end up in honey, some of the components, right? So they consume by consuming the honey. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and one of the things that I think one of these sort of buried findings in Renata's work is that um, colonies um, that were enriched with propolis, so resin-rich colonies or propolis-rich colonies, their food, the royal jelly that they're feeding the larva, had higher antimicrobial activity uh, than resin poor colonies. And so what we don't know and what we're trying to work out too is whether or not the, the royal jelly that the bees are producing in those colonies is just naturally more full of antimicrobial compounds because of what they're exposed to, or if the propolis is sort of leaching into that royal jelly, um, which is a really cool question. And, and something that we're, um, we were supposed to work on this year, but it'll be next spring now. Um, and the same thing could be happening with honey. Uh, you know, in some ways, 
uh, some places, and especially when you seem to be breeding for more propolis, they might line that uh, the top of the wax cell um, with propolis. And so there might be more sort of leaching into honey, into royal jelly that happens um, when we're um, basically not breeding bees that don't collect propolis, which is what we've been doing in this country for the last hundreds of years. Yeah. Well, that's exactly my point that I'm going to follow up here. I want to ask you if you know why, uh, if there is any event that happened here, because I, I, I as people at home know, I, I'm from Brazil. I was born around propolis. So Africanized bees propolize everything, including yourself, if you let them. Uh, and when I got here, that was a that's a true story at the USDA. I, I tried to open a hive and the, I was I put so much energy that the, the cover almost flew away. I wasn't expecting to be that easy. And that was funny. Uh, what happened here? So what happened to so people start to select is just because messed up with the management or, or there is something else? No, so I don't I think a lot of it. Well, it wasn't intentional um, in terms of, oh, this stuff uh, you know, it was good for the bees. It was more, oh, it's a pain to get into. So if I have to breed from a colony, uh, I'm going to breed into the one that I can open up more easily than the one that I can't. And I think that's uh, that unintentional um, sort of, uh, I mean, it's it was somewhat active selection against because you cho were choosing the one against the ones that, um, that were collecting a lot of propolis. But I think a lot of that, um, it was, you know, not knowing or not thinking that, oh, bees are bringing this in for a reason. Um, and we should be sort of promoting that. Um, and I think I think that's really what happened. Absolutely. We should promote that. And I, that's going to be part of my mission now. I'm going to I'm producing a lot of videos. You guys stay stay at home. Uh, you can expect a lot of videos about propolis coming soon. Uh, yeah, I would say from the Africanized bee perspective, or at least in Brazil, right, the other issue is that there's a huge market for propolis um, coming out of South America, right? And and so it's a huge product, and they make a lot of money on propolis. And so um, that hasn't really caught on here, um, and it's the same in Europe. And, and part of that's in areas where they rely some more on natural medicines and stuff. But some of these amazing pictures of um Brazilian colonies that harvest and collect propolis, you know, how they, they do it. They have a wall. Um, the hive wall is basically slats, right? And they'll be an inch, uh, inch tall slats and you remove the slats, the bees fill it with propolis. You remove the next slat until the whole wall is propolis. And yeah. inch thick of propolis, you know, both and they ways. do it very fast. And you yeah. guys at home, if you never saw that, stay tuned. I'm going to do this live from Brazil. Just yeah, wait. it's amazing. Yeah, because then you think, oh, our bees collect a lot of propolis or this colony. And it's like, no, it's nowhere near. <laughs> no, no, we have, we have no idea what amount of propolis is. Yeah, that's why I try to to show people the difference is gigantic. It's, it's humongous the differences. Uh, Mike, I start to do experiment myself. The commercial beekeepers are around the country now. We're playing with some propolis things we're, we're planning to do. I have a question for you. Something that I start to struggle myself right now is when you say propolis, could be anything, right? Because depending on the plant source, we're talking with different chemicals. How you deal with that in the research, uh, with your research? Yeah, so... And when you say it could be anything, I thought you were going to say it could be caulk or asphalt because... Oh, uh, no, I'm talking about bees, different plant sources and yeah. different chemicals, but that's No, and that's one thing, but the bees will actually collect caulk or asphalt when there aren't the resources because, you know, I think they're attracted to the terpenoid-rich things, right? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. So, you know, obviously I talked about or I showed that uh, that work that's been done on regional variation, uh, at least with respect to chalk brood. Um, there have been some other studies, though, on viruses like HIV virus showing that propolis from all around the world had sort of similar activity. So um, it kind of depends a little bit on what you're looking at, if that activity, um, it might not differ at all. And it might, and it might be hyper-regional where it matters. So 
Um, typically what I like to do in studies is I'll like to use, um, now I'm, because I have connections and I can, I can use propolis from Minnesota. I use lo local propolis here. And then I still like to use Brazilian propolis. Um, and I like to use Brazilian propolis uh, for a lot of different things because uh, one of the main reasons is we know what plant it's come from and uh, the chemistry is super well defined. There's a, a lot of work on um, the chemistry of um, Brazilian green propolis. And so it's sort of a nice sort of control. But I think it's important to use um, you know, regional propolis and, and then see if those effects translate to whatever. Um, and, and you think most propolis is coming from many, many different trees, many different plant sources. So, um, you know, it's going to maybe have some regional difference, but overall the trend should be the same. And then maybe one place it'll be more impactful than another. Um, but if the bees are bringing it in, um, they're bringing that stuff in for a reason because they're attracted to it for these reasons and this antimicrobial activity really. Yeah, it, I, I, I got similar uh, conclusion. I start to look for companies that could help me to provide some propolis and yeah, the most consistent is, is we have much more information coming from Brazil for obvious reasons. They produce much more there. So yeah, that's been where I'm trying to get my, the propolis for future experiments. Uh, Mike, let's see if I get some questions from the people here. Uh, people at home, uh, I have a little problem. The software I'm using is not getting my answers from YouTube. However, there is a very nice gentleman, Duncan Mason, coming and getting the, the questions from YouTube and posting on Facebook. So end up here with me. So uh, please keep doing, keep question, sending your questions and Mr. Mason is going to send it to me through our Facebook. So let's start here. I want, first of all, I want to say thank you to Cayman Reynolds from Tennessee's Bees for the super chat donation, $20. Thank you, Cayman. I appreciate it. Uh, so let's see. Questions. Uh, this is a, let's put here. Lon Woodard said, does propolis have a shelf life? Yeah, it's, um, I would say that it's not extremely well studied, but it does have, um, again, because propolis is um, mostly producing these volatile compounds um, that raw propolis, so uh, that is going to have a shelf life over time. If you put it in the freezer though, however, um, it'll last um, for years. Um, and if you extract it, so you extract it in uh, a 70% ethanol or um, or a 70% of a sort of a pure alcohol, um, because you don't, it extracts better if there's a little bit of water in that alcohol, you get more of the compounds and you filter out the wax. If you put that um, in an amber bottle or you wrap it up in foil um, because some of the compounds will degrade with UV and that kind of stuff, um, then it, it's going to last for, um, for a, a very long time. Um, but yeah, the raw propolis itself um, will lose some activity over time, um, but it maintains, uh, it maintains a good bit over time. And what we say when sort of with the bees and the bee boxes um, is that they're constantly refreshing it and bringing in more propolis and a little bit at a time. So the, from the bees perspective, the propolis that they're bringing in uh, is gonna be constantly this mix of, of fresh and stuff. So, um, so from that, uh, it still works very well, you know, years later. Yeah, that's that's my understanding too. If you get the propolis and stock the way it is, the, the shelf life is low. But if you extract immediately with alcohol and and then you keep that protected from light, that you can you can use the benefit of propolis for a long, long time. Yeah. All right. So let me see another question. See, Sean, Sean, Meister. All right. Sean, uh, are there ways to encourage propolis in already existing hive boxes? Yeah, so one, um, 
way that we've done this in the in the past and uh, and others has shown this uh, this study by um, led by Hodges um, out of Barry Brosey's lab. Um, they actually, and we did this too a long time ago, basically um, scored the boxes, the inside of the boxes with a, a wire brush, um, a, a, you know, um, connected to a drill um, so that you could really score the inside of the boxes. Um, it seems like that rough texture um, really is what stimulates that, um, that propolis. Um, deposition around around the hive walls. Um, but the other way you can get commercial propolis traps, you can also use uh, things like landscape cloth or feed bags and put them on the top of the colonies. Um, and then they'll um, put propolis on the, on the top of the colony and that alone does make a difference. Um, and then you can harvest it that way too. The, I think the best way to encourage it with those kind of devices um, is to then put a rim around, um, like a, an inch or two inch rim, ideally with holes drilled on it. Um, and then if you have a migratory lid um, that you put on that, so you put the propolis um, trap or the landscape cloth or whatever you're using that encourages the propolis on top, right on top of the hive and then you have a rim and then you have your lid and that um, encourages the holes around that rim encourage air movement and light flow into the hive, um, which the bees don't want. So then they propolize it all. Um, and then, uh, and that will really um, encourage propolis in, in that way. Very nice, very nice. So let's move on here. Uh, what's next? Uh, 18 bees is asking, have you done work on propolis breathability and waterproofing? You know, I haven't. And it's something that sort of pops up every now and again um, that um, there was um, a study I found, I don't know, several years ago now that um, propolis was basically working on sort of evaporative cooling in the colonies and that's how it functioned. Um, so I focus mostly on sort of the, the disease and health aspects, um, but definitely propolis, especially in tree cavities, is having um, large effects on the ability of a colony to maintain their nest environment, right? So uh, I think there's a lot of things that propolis is doing, um, both structurally sort of and, uh, and from this sort of environmental aspect um, that has also been understudied. All right. So next question is coming from Derek Lewis. How we have a little control over propolis sources for an apiary. Is there any synthetic propolis available? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, as I said, I mean, they'll pick up asphalt and caulk, but that doesn't mean that that's good for them for their health. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think with the thing about propolis, right, is that this is sort of one of their natural defenses. So we're going to try to encourage them to go to their their natural sources uh, and uh, and really, you know, um, go with that. From in terms of like adding it as an additive to other things, you know, it's one of these things like adding essential oils. You know, kind of the the dose is what's important and that would be something that would be really important to figure out some of these key ingredients and those kinds of things. Um, but in terms of sort of coating a hive with a synthetic um, propolis, it's just such a complex mixture and we really don't know. Uh, I don't think that there's one secret ingredient that's the answer to the story. It's the fact that there is a complex mixture. Um, and actually some of the compounds might be bad, right? But then they're overcompensated by all these good ones. So uh, I think it's really this complex mixture that's driving a lot um, of what's going on. And I would say, so I showed um, how the propolis um, boxes uh, increased in sort of the deposition from August to, um, to February, and they almost doubled the amount of propolis they had. So, they were in August in South Dakota where there are very few trees. And then they went to California uh, in a holding yard um, in November 
where there's even less trees. Um, and so they're able, if they want the propolis, um, they're gonna they're gonna get it um, uh, if there's any sources around, and they will sort of increase that. Um, but yeah, if you're um, you know really totally devoid of trees and they're not bringing in resin, then um, then there's not a whole lot you can do. All right. Next question from Derek again. I grew up in Africa. Were they accumulated much more propolis? Are they uh, also they are mite resistant? Could the two be related? Yeah, so some of the, um, at least the work on, um, you know, propolis and Africanized bees, a lot of that I was coming from Brazil, um, South America. Um, you know, some of this where accumulation of much more propolis is because bees are bred to increase propolis because it's a economic advantage, right? Some of it is obviously likely resource availability too, right? So the, those things are sort of hard to um, disentangle, but also in Africa, right, the colonies are managed totally different. They're, they definitely wouldn't have been bred um, against propolis. And then they're also typically managed in kind of like more like tree cavity things as far as my understanding is. So then they would more likely be in rough surfaces that would encourage um, propolis deposition. Um, now, could mite resistance and propolis um, be related? I mean, there was this one study that showed um, that, you know, they are bringing more resin as they get more mites. Uh, however, um, that's sort of like a catch-22, right? Because they shouldn't have more mites if they're mite resistant and bringing more propolis. So it kind of gets confusing there. Um, I can say that from Renata's work and my work, um, we haven't seen a connection between varroa levels and amount of propolis. Um, but, and, and certainly with Africanized bees, they have many, many different traits that are involved in how they're mite resistant. All right, so let's see here. Uh, I will destroy your name if I try to say it. So for, please forgive me. I will just go straight to the question. Uh, does propolis cause a change or increase in the number of beneficial bacteria? For example, again, uh, Kunke bacteria. Yeah, so um, the that's one thing that we're really following up on. Um, it, it seemed to cause some increases in what we think are beneficial bacteria or core bacteria, uh, and then and a decrease in some that might not be. Um, and this is kind of, again, in these kind of two studies with the, one with the mouth parts and then one with the guts that I was involved with. Um, however, um, I think the most interesting and convincing thing, again, was that the, um, that the similarity across colonies in the gut microbiome uh, and likewise with the mouth parts. So across colony environments, which is really the main driver of sort of variation uh, in all things, especially microbiome, uh, was this um, propolis rich environment really had very stable communities. And then when the colonies that were um, not propolis rich, where they didn't have propolis, their community structure was all over the place. So some were had high this and high that and, and very diverse. So again, sort of really stabilize that microbiome. Um, because if we think about like a beneficial bacteria, um, there's probably too high, um, probably makes it from a beneficial to not beneficial, right? So it's all about having this um, sort of uh, stable community structure, uh, I think is, um, is potentially what's driving that. But we're we're looking a lot at that um, right now. We're um, actually looking, we're doing an experiment now looking at are some bacteria, again, maybe some of these core um, of what we think of beneficial, are they more resistant to propolis uh, when we feed them or just uh, when they're plated against bacteria or and are some other ones more susceptible to it? So um, we're doing a lot of work trying to, to tease that apart and what might be happening. No, it, I think it's fascinating to think about that for the evolutionary perspective, you know, those the balance of all those chemicals coming from different resins and the honeybees together to 
to end up with this very little amount of bacteria that compose the, the, the flora of the gut. It, it, it amazes me to see how little amount of bacteria we have. Yeah. Another question for you. Do pesticides accumulate differently in propolis than in raw lumber? So that's a good question. We didn't um, we didn't test the the lumber or the boxes themselves, um, and I would assume so again because the resin or the propolis is the mix of the resin with the wax and um, a lipophilic and uh, there's a uh, and hydrophilic compounds in it. So the herbicides are um, more hydrophilic, and so that's why we think they ended up in the in the propolis a bit more. Um, we can again think that that matrix of propolis allows more compounds to go in. Um, and I would imagine that that lumber, you know, wouldn't be that similar. It wouldn't be similar to wax either, probably, right? So I would imagine it would be lower. But um, but yeah, I don't know for sure. Yeah, a lot of a lot of work for us to do. Yes. All right. Uh, I will take three more questions. Uh, first one, it is from Jack. What are the mechanisms that Poline oh, uses to resist mites? Yeah, so the Pauline uh, are derived from the uh, line that was developed here earlier called Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. Um, and uh, and really all Pauline was is then one, these VSH or Varroa Sensitive Hygiene lines that were outcrossed to commercial beekeepers um, to increase honey production and then sort of brought back and really focus on this Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. And what Varroa Sensitive Hygiene is, is that these are uh, bees that are able to detect um, pupa that have a reproductive mite on them that's producing offspring. Uh, and then they pull that pupa out with the mite, thus uh, eliminating the mite population growth. So really the mite population can't grow because you're removing all the reproductive mites uh, constantly. Uh, and that's really the, the sole mechanism um, that has been um, you know, bred into the pauline. All right, thank you. Oh, this is an interesting question. Amy Mutsanti is asking, if propolis has a shelf life, is there any benefit to not scrapping it out between columns? Yeah, so I actually, people always ask, oh, should we not be scraping things? So this sort of goes with that question, right? And I actually say, no, go ahead and scrape your boxes because then the bees will bring in more propolis and, and that will uh, sort of, that can encourage them to collect some more, especially like at the end of the year and that kind of thing. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, then especially if you're gonna do something with it, um, then go ahead uh, and scrape it. I think they're probably a little bit more encouraged um, by the scraping um, than, than just continually adding to it. Um, yeah. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, let's see what we got here. Ned Stone is asking, would a hive with heavy propolis accumulation discourage wax moth and hive beetles? Yeah, so the um, we're not totally sure about uh, wax moths really, um, but um, there has been work on, um, you know, again in the lab with wax moths and propolis can kill wax moths. Um, again, sort of, the other thing about propolis accumulation, especially heavy propolis accumulation, um, they're only going to be able to collect lots of propolis when they're strong. Um, it's a very small proportion of bees that are actually foraging for resins, less than 1% of foragers. So that's why you don't see a, a hit in honey production either. So it's still a very small proportion. So you do have to have strong colonies to produce lots of resin, right? And that's probably the ultimate defining factor. And what's going to discourage wax moths, right? Um, and so there is potentially um, with these, uh, with a, a strong propolis envelope, maybe that will uh, discourage wax moths too, or it will prevent them from pupating as suggested from the lab studies. But uh, I can't say that uh, anybody's done that work for sure. And for hive beetles, I think um, that's a really cool story um, that with these, um, in Africa and, you know, uh, Jamie Ellis has done this stuff where uh, with 
bees putting hive beetles in propolis prisons. So they kind of will put them up in the corner and that's probably when you break the, the cover open and then you release all the, uh, the hive beetles because you've unlocked the prison. Um, so bees will kind of corral them into these propolis, um, uh, propolis prisons. Um, it doesn't seem to kill them outright, but it certainly prevents them from laying eggs. Um, and, and maybe it would, um, you know, propolis might uh, have effect on larvae and eggs as well. But, um, but yeah, certainly bees using propolis to sort of corral the beetles um, has an effect. All right. Thank you. Before I go to the last question, I want to thank you, Union Company, uh, Bee Company, for the super chat donation. Thank you very much. And now the last question of tonight is from 18 bees. Is the brood comb layered with propolis? Yeah, so this is always um, something that sort of talked about um, and, and you think, oh, that's why the comb's getting darker because they are layering propolis in there. There's actually now some more mixed evidence or unknown about how much propolis actually ends up in the comb. Um, I always thought it was very little, um, but again, um, especially I think in, in Europe, and I don't know if you see this in the Africanized bees, but um, you know, they, they will have a, a rim of propolis around the top of the cells. Um, and so in theory, that would get um, sort of layered into the comb a little bit over time. Um, but we actually don't really know very well about how much um, propolis is in the wax. Some people have done sort of extracts of wax, and all of that stuff to try to get um, to get to see how much propolis and none of that's been terribly convincing i don't think but it seems like there might be some in there um but but not very much and and it would depend on how much propolis probably the colonies are collecting period uh one thing from the practical perspective i never studied myself but remembering my time with africanized bees i always remember to have a, a halo on the top of the wax and i always got confused when i got here because here, dark uh, wax means they're old. They're accumulating a lot of things. And I think now, coming back to me, in Brazil, the dark part, it's, it's, it's propolis. It's not, even when they are very fresh, you can see the hollow that only wax, but everything else around is kind of dark, including inside the, the, the cell. Uh, I can't guarantee that, but that's my gut feeling telling here from my practical uh, understanding of the subject. So I will, well, as I said, I'm into propolis now. I'm going to investigate all of those things and bring answers. Yeah, and really you have to extract some wax in, yeah. and ethanol, you know, and see um, what kind of, uh, sort of, yeah, compounds are coming out of it. That's probably the best way to, to get at it. Okay. Mike, I said, I know that I said it was the last question, but there is one, the last one that came in, and I think you are the guy to answer this one. From Amy again, do colonists collect more propolis when they are under increased pathogen pressures? Yeah, so what we found, at least with respect to chalkbrood, that um, they will bring in more, um, more resin when they're infected with chalkbrood. Uh, an, another group out of Germany found um, a similar result with respect to some viral infection, or at least um, there was some evidence that there was some bringing in with respect to deformed wing virus. And another group found um, they're bringing more resin um, when they have more varroa. So, um, but we didn't find that against American Valbrood. So there's sort of this mixed um, bag, right? But it's clear that um, that they are responding um, by increasing propolis um, against certain circumstances, um, which which is pretty cool. I think um, that they're you know basically foraging for medicine uh, in a way which is which is really exciting. You know that bees are doing that, um, and so we really need to to try to understand that a little bit more. Again, the colonies are going to need to be strong. Um, to do that. And, you know, I would say that um, there are other instances where they collect things like this when they're under not just um, sort of pathogen pressure, but maybe um, 
parasite pressure from like wasps and those kinds of things. So um, bees are known to restrict their entrances and, and one way that they do that is with propolis. So uh, we talked about, you know, like with hornets and, uh, and there's uh, the Asian honeybee actually puts sort of fecal matter on uh, their colonies, right, to ward yep. off hornets. And so propolis can be doing that same thing because a lot of that is masking smells. Um, so I, I do think that, that it's pretty amazing that bees are collecting uh, these things in response to sort of, again, um, that a subset of foragers, a few bees are collecting a lot more resin um, to handle uh, sort of the diseases that other colonies or other bees in their colonies are facing. So that's sort of this like perfect little pandemic story, I think, where, you know, the colony is really taking care of itself. Yeah, that's fascinating to me too. The, the collection and the, the ev evolutionary stories uh, about that, how how that happened, you know, I always kind of think about that. How uh, Ape Serana, for example, was selected, what kind of situation happened for them to decide to get poop to put right. at the entrance, entrance of the hive to protect themselves against hornets. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is a video that's coming soon too. Um, uh, and the authors are excited about that. So we're going to have all this, this whole thing with the live stream about that paper too. So yeah. stay tuned. So I want to say thank you, Mike, for your time today. I really appreciate I think all of I can speak for all of us here in the beekeeping community for your work, for the dedication uh, and all your peers there at the uh, USDA. Uh, it was very nice of you. So what's the main message here about propolis to beekeepers? How we can conclude this? Because I like to say all the time that breed for propolis. Uh, we need to bring propolis back, something like that. What's your message to beekeepers? My message is that really the bees are strong and they have all kinds of these amazing defenses. Propolis is one of them. And we should really be encouraging sort of all of them, one at a time, all together. You know, we can make bees stronger using their own defenses. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next one. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys at home. All right. So.